Welcome to Success Story, the most useful podcast in the world. I'm your host, Scott D. Clary. The Success Story podcast is part of the Blue Wire podcast network, as well as the HubSpot podcast network, which has other great podcasts like Socialite, hosted by Steph Taylor. Socialite discusses all things online marketing. Steph Taylor answers all your business marketing questions. She deep dives into the nitty gritty of online marketing, uh, content marketing, social media marketing, marketing strategy for business owners. If any of these topics resonate with you, you're gonna love the show. You'll learn things like how to scale your brand on various uh, different social media platforms, some of the biggest mistakes you can make with your launch of a new product or service, uh, the importance of nurturing and engaging your audience consistently, uh, the importance of having your audience fully understand the problem you're trying to solve and why it's important to solve right now, as well as why growing audiences across all social platforms feels so hard in 2022. You can go listen to Socialite wherever you get your podcast or at the HubSpot Podcast Network at hubspot.com slash podcast network. Today, my guest is Ian Clifford. He is a director, CEO, and founder of Fuel Positive Corp. He has over 25 years of experience in technology and marketing. He has successfully led the company to global brand recognition through their unique energy solution. Since 2006, Ian has raised over $50 million in equity financing for Fuel Positive. He also, previous to Fuel Positive, co-founded Digit Interactive, a full-service internet marketing company serving Fortune 500 clients, which he exited and sold. Now, what he's doing at Fuel Positive is incredible. Fuel Positive is a Canadian growth stage technology company making their name known because of their commitment to providing commercially viable and sustainable clean energy and fossil fuel alternatives. So they focus on technologies that are clean, economical, and build on what's easily in place, the infrastructure that's already in place. They've created green ammonia. They've created uh, an environmentally friendly way to create ammonia as an alternative to fossil fuel. Fuel positive will affect the course of climate change through the practical solutions they're implementing green ammonia, and other solutions. Well, we spoke about Ian's origin story. We spoke about his transition from photographer to uh, tech CEO and how he got behind um, both the EV movement when he first built and uh, sold a company that created electric vehicles way before Tesla, all the way through to fuel positive and what he's doing right now, what he's been doing for the past, uh, past several years. So we spoke about his inspiration as well as how to build a business in a space that is inundated with legacy infrastructure, legacy products, um, and how he manages to basically create an industry, a blue ocean, so to speak. So we spoke about some of the the lessons that he's learned with Fuel Positive, how he's taking it to market, how he is lobbying and working with government, how he's working with farmers, how he's uh, marketing it through word of mouth um, to basically change and shift Uh, course correct climate change through some of these practical solutions uh, and then ultimately how he built a team around such an innovative company uh, that makes sure that the company the vision and the mission is all successful so let's jump right into it this is ian clifford director ceo founder of fuel positive corp Well, it, it, you can go way, way back in my life and, and look at a, a pretty varied path. But one thing that's remained really consistent for me is, is a strong sense of environmentalism, um, a real appreciation for um, preserving this incredible planet that we've been destroying now profoundly for the last century and realizing that things you know have to change. And if they don't change now, um, as the youngest generation is telling us, um, we're, we're leaving a disaster for, uh, for future generations. And so the, it's an imperative. It's an absolute imperative. So, I, I mean, I can trace it back, um, you know, during high school and the end of high school, I, I was very interested in photography and I was really fortunate. I met um, one of Ansel Adams' um, key uh, assistants um, back then, and and he invited me out to Yosemite uh, to work with Ansel Adams um, when I was about 17, 18 years old, and uh, and study with him and, and just learn about this incredibly 
rich history of of preservation like this it, what ansel was beyond anything else he was an archivist like he was taking photographs of of landscapes and 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 nature that that in many cases doesn't exist anymore those views are gone and and it created an appreciation for how important it is to preserve and and better our environment um, globally so and and that can start and you know people say well it's so big i can't do anything my attitude is you know every little thing that you can do makes a difference and if we have billions and billions of people pushing towards change pushing towards environmental change it's going to happen i mean it just has to happen whether governments are doing it or not uh, people can make things happen and that was that was a real uh, lesson that I, I learned from Ansel. And, um, you know, he started, he was one of the co-founders of the Sierra Club. They were looking at, you know, how do they preserve these incredible uh, landscapes for future generations and, and of course, for wildlife and, and, flora, and flora and fauna across the spectrum. So, um, and that really stuck with me. Um, so, the, so my career, it, my career really started as a photographer. I, I was studying photography in Halifax at um, Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. Another real appreciation of nature, because you know the East Coast was was at that time very unspoiled. Um, there was a, incredible tracts of nature, and and I spent a lot of time doing landscape photography, um, looking at um, looking at again looking at landscapes that were changing and contrasting those to urban development, uh, which was, you know, kind of out of control, you know, in, and that was, I was seeing that everywhere that I went in the world, there was just this sense that we just had to build and build and build and expand and expand and expand um, and create massive infrastructure as opposed to simplifying things. So, um, so that really started me on, on the path to where I am now. It's taken a number of twists and turns along the way, but, but that certainly is the basis of, of I the, I think what inspires me today. I was gonna say, I love the, I love the, um, I love the origin story. I love, I love what, what drives people. And it's interesting. So you were, so you, you got into photography, um, when did you when did you pivot that because you you're capturing nature and you're capturing um you're capturing the state of the world through an aesthetic and an artistic lens but when did you decide hey this is too easy i want to start building companies i want to start doing something that is going to be uh the wild west i have to figure out how to do it i have to build this entire new industry it's not like you're a traditional entrepreneur where, uh, you know, you're just taking a new product to market and you've already seen it done. You've already seen five or six iterations of that product. You're doing something net new. So why did you decide to build something that was never really, I'm assuming when this has started, uh, never been done before, nothing like it existed. Um, and what was, what was your mindset there and why did you, why did you take that first step? Well, it, it, it went through a number of different transitions, and I was always kind of a little, a, a few steps ahead uh, in terms of what was trending. So my first big pivot was to move from sort of traditional photography into digital photography, and that was before um, anyone was even considering. Um, I mean, it, it was before uh, everybody was a photographer on, on their cell phone, so uh, on their or whatever mobile device they were using. So I was I was already looking at a digital world. Um, uh, and looking at things differently from that perspective. And then early in the 90s, um, uh, with the, the, the sort of the, the, this little kind of hint of the internet, um, myself and, and several partners started an internet marketing company, which was one of the first in Canada. Um, we built some of the first commercial websites in Canada. So there was a real, uh, just sort of looking at thing, where things were going um, has always been a big part of my interest. Um, so we built that company. We sold it um, back in 2000 um, to Quebec Corps, um, kind of at the height of the market. And, and I really, at that point, was reevaluating what I wanted to do next. And interestingly, I had a fascination with electric cars for a long, long time. So in 2001, I started an electric car company in Canada. It's called Zen Motor Company. And we built neighborhood electric vehicles. We sold about a thousand of them in North America. It made us one of the biggest electric car companies in the world at the time. At the time? Yeah. Again, we were totally ahead of the curve. So the adoption just wasn't there. 
Um, but I became really interested in energy storage and energy um, battery technology, but also energy generally and what sustainable um, with sustainable production and how to shift uh, our concept of what energy is um, on a global on a global scale, and that evolved to a, a battery technology that we are still commercializing, actually um, based uh, based in Texas, interestingly. And so that's a project that's um, still very much uh, very much active. We're working with a group associated with NASA on that project. But about a year and a half ago, I became really interested in the idea of replacing fossil fuels. So mm -hmm. it's one thing, battery electric is interesting and battery electric is um, scalable to an extent, but there's a lot of issues around um, energy storage to begin with. And there's a lot of issues around lithium and, uh, and all the other um, uh, the elements that go into battery technology today, it's, it's high, it has a huge environmental footprint. Um, it doesn't have the energy density of fossil fuels. So I thought, w what can we look at that will, that will actually, in the near term, um, be viable as a replacement for fossil fuels? So I was introduced to, um, to um, a, a scientist and his team um, at Ontario Technology University, this was about 18 months ago, um, who were developing a, a green ammonia system. And I really, did, at the time, didn't know a lot about ammonia. Um, I didn't, I, my, my experience with ammonia was like most of us kind of, you know, that weird smell at the skating rink kind of thing, that right? Natural. With a refrigeration system that's not working yeah. properly. Um, so I didn't understand the, the, the scope and, and learned very, very quickly that, that ammonia as a technology, as a material has been around for a century. 80% um, of it is used in agriculture as a fertilizer. And the industry that manufactures ammonia and has for, for the last century is one of the dirtiest industries on the planet in the sense of a, from an emissions perspective. So to produce a unit of ammonia in traditional um, processes is one of the most carbon intense manufacturing processes on the planet. So the idea that you could change that and, and create a um, a truly green alternative to the way that something's been done for a century um, was of great interest to me. Um, and Dr. Ibrahim Dinser and his team were, you know, were extremely forthcoming when it came to really educating us in terms of what the viability was. Um, so that got us really interested. We did a tremendous amount of due diligence on the technology. Um, April of 2021, um, we entered into a purchase agreement uh, with Dr. Dinser and his team to purchase the intellectual property. And, and since then, we've been commercializing it. So this is a, a you know, relatively uh, new endeavor, but we've got up to speed in an incredible pace over the last, um, over the last 12 months. Interestingly, I, it's almost to the day that we did our name change from um, the previous company name to Fuel Positive. So it's really, really new. But it's moving quick. It's moving like super, super quick. Super um, fast. Yeah. Now, now tease something out, like some, provide some context because, of course, like you just mentioned, and you're 100% right, nobody really thinks of ammonia in the sense of this is going to be the future fuel source that's going to power anything. Um, I don't think people have that concept. Um, most people have the concept of, okay, well, let's get in, let's get more EVs on the road. And that's a great step. And why is, you just mentioned a few things like, uh, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to try and reiterate because I'm going to miss, I'm going to misspeak, but why is there such a focus on battery and battery, battery technology for certain carbon uh, emitting uh, vehicles and whatnot? Like, 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 and that's what people are focused on right now. And there seems to be a wave of EV and you have Rivian and you have Tesla and you have all these other EV companies. And now you have these government mandates that are focused on EVs. So it seems like the rest of the world is focused on the thing that you were doing uh, uh, several years ago that you found wasn't actually a solution to any sort of global warming carbon emissions problem. So what there's a disconnect there. Yeah, and, and I guess, I mean, you, you have to look at it from a number of perspectives. Um, the reason EVs are viable, of course, is that there's infrastructure. There's a, yeah. you can charge, you can charge a vehicle. Um, we've all, you know, we've all got outlets in our houses. We've all 
for the most part have access to higher voltage systems for recharging and that sort of thing. Um, electricity is ubiquitous. It's, you know, in most, in most, in many cultures, not, but again, not around the world. So, um, and, and interestingly, if you start, if you look at the numbers of vehicles, electric vehicles that are sold on an annual basis today, it's still a drop in the bucket in terms of the number of vehicles that are produced and sold around the world. Not to mention the fact that there's, you know, a couple of billion internal combustion vehicles on the road today around the world spewing out um, spewing out emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions that are destroying the environment around the world. So those have to be dealt with as well. Yes. So the, the, the thing that isn't, again, isn't understand, understood about ammonia is historically it has been used as a fossil fuel replacement. So there's many examples during the Second World War, for instance, where fossil fuel, there were extensive fossil fuel shortages. Um, and engineers understood that um, in in a internal combustion engine, the conversion to burn um, pure ammonia is relatively straightforward. It's it's not unlike a conversion to burn propane or or natural gas, for instance. So, again, it's it's highly viable. But but and then subsequent to that, NASA um, it was utilizing pure ammonia and oxygen as a as a jet fuel. Um, in, okay. In, okay. That's our one sort of fastest jets in the world were, were running on ammonia. Um, but uh, the reason it never had any widespread, uh, widespread penetration was because you were kind of replacing apples and apples because the emissions to produce yeah. ammonia was, there was no advantage in that context. But with the advent of green ammonia, um, you, it changed the whole paradigm changes, right? And and the 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 ease of conversion um, becomes very 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 significant as a consideration. And it's interesting because I mean we have a lot of conversations going on at different levels within government and and advocacy groups, and and the awareness is growing on a daily basis. I mean the the rest of this week we've got meetings um, with uh, with various. Uh, various agencies within the Canadian government who are yeah. really serious about understanding the viability of this. So uh, it's it's going to happen. And it's happening. I mean, it's, you know, I said we started this in seriously about a year ago. It is it's breakneck right, right now. I mean, we we can't grow this company fast enough um, to keep up with the interest. So um, I was going to say, so this because that's so now you because you found a way to to produce this in a in a much cleaner way. That's that's the IP. That's like the the secret sauce behind the company, and that's yeah. what was stopping uh, ammonia from being adopted. Okay, so this makes a lot of sense now. So yes, of course, we, there was a lot of infrastructure to support um, uh, EV, but of course now you have the now you have the production uh, that can create ammonia with without much of a, a negative impact. So then this can st uh, then you start to lobby government then now all of a sudden the conversation revolves around looking at alternative fossil fuels and that's when you have vehicles that could use green amo well, ammonia as a, as a fuel source yeah okay understood very exciting so you're so you don't you don't uh you don't make it easy on yourself either like you you jump into stuff like like right at the like like that's like bleeding edge it's stuff that's like you need to you need to build the production um, the production line. You have to actually lobby the government, and then this you're creating your own market for this as you go. Well, it, it's it, and, you know for us, we're taking more of a Tesla model uh, approach to this because uh, historically, you know what happens and ve what very often happens is you know you'll get entrepreneurs with really great ideas. Um, they'll bring the idea forward, but they won't have a commercial plan. Right. They won't yeah, know that a lot. It. Yeah. And, and I've seen it a lot and I've done it. You know, I, I, I've learned from experience that, you know, in order to to make a great idea stick, you've got to figure out how to manufacture it and manufacture it efficiently and quickly and with proper distribution and proper um, support. So that's a, a big part of our our build of this company is around uh, around those capabilities and knowing that we can scale this. Um, incredibly rapidly uh, and at a global scale. So one of the big differences um, to understand in, in how we're doing things as opposed to how the industry has historically done things, um, gray ammonia or dirty ammonia has always been produced sort of at a refinery scale um, production, right? So the ammonia industry sort of t has been tied to the oil and gas industry for the last century because they, you know, their ammonia production has been entirely dependent on fossil fuel. 
um, over the last century. Our systems are modular and scalable. They're small. Um, they're intended to be um, deployed with end users as opposed to mass uh, centralized production and distribution of green ammonia. Um, so what we're doing is giving um, initially farmers the opportunity to have a fuel positive system on their farm utilizing renewable energy. It could be solar on the farm. It could be, they could be on a, on a renewable grid. Uh, Manitoba is a great example. It's, it's, uh, it's all um, uh, carbon free electricity and very, very low cost. They can produce then and utilizing a fuel positive system using, using electricity, water and air. They can produce all of the anhydrous ammonia they need for fertilizer. Um, they can use, they can produce enough to use for grain drying, so they can replace fossil fuels for drying, drying crops. Uh, and they can convert their tractors and combines and other implements to run on the ammonia that they're producing. So a farmer who was, who was an absolute hostage of supply chain and cost variability, like insane cost variability. We're talking about in Manitoba, a farmer who was paying $600 a ton um, for anhydrous ammonia six months ago was paying $1,200 a ton today. I mean, these are insane. And, and same with yeah. fossil fuel costs, right? And supply. So the supply chains are all screwed up. So what we're doing is it's, it's not only revolutionary from a production perspective, but it also creates this independence for the end user. Right. So they're they're off grid, essentially. They're mm -hmm. they're able to produce everything they need um, to grow crops, to produce, um, to run their equipment uh, and so on. Uh, and that's I mean, you can imagine the response that we're getting in terms of interest, because, I mean, farmers are one of the most vulnerable. Um, it's one of the most vulnerable prof professions on the planet. Not only is it the weather, but it's everything else in, in the supply chain, your your um, you're deeply affected by. So what we're doing is we're saying, no, you don't need that supply chain. You, you have the skill, you know how to work with this material. Um, we, can, we can make it for you on site where you need it and you can control your costs and you can control your supply and, and, and be remarkably independent. And so we've got, we've got a number of farmers lined up um, uh, throughout 2022 for pilot projects. So we've got, we're building systems now that will be deployed um, throughout uh, throughout 2022, um, and you know the proof is in the delivery, and the proof is in the system working on farm, and and that's where we're starting because that's the. And that's. I just want to take a second and thank the sponsor of today's episode, HubSpot. Now, running your own business means uncertainty is everywhere. So, wouldn't it be nice to have a CRM platform that just works? A CRM platform that helps you provide a seamless, connected, best-in-class customer experience. For too long, businesses have had to deal with managing point solutions that slow down their teams, frustrate customers, and hit them with hidden fees. HubSpot's all-in-one CRM platform has everything you need to do business, no hidden fees included. With a connected platform that's easy to implement and use, your teams have all the tools and data they need to spend more time on what matters most, creating remarkable customer experiences. Learn how HubSpot can help your business grow better at HubSpot.com. That's to take the market. So I was gonna that was gonna be my question. It's how do you how do you actually market and sell um, something that nobody has a concept of? So you're working with you're working with farmers first. Um, you're eliminating any sort of variability, at least from um, from a fuel perspective, for them, and that would be like your your proof of concept. And then after you work with these farmers, you you how do you sort of blow this up on a global level? How do you start to um, approach new partners, approach new government agencies? Is there like a sales and marketing plan for that? Because I, I just find it incredibly interesting selling something that, again, it's that blue ocean. So when I always think of blue ocean, I come from a software background. Um, so if, if my questions aren't that intelligent regarding like fuel and, and fuel substitution, I apologize, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to navigate as best I can. No, but I um, I it's, it's a totally, it's a, it's an incredible concept, but in a, like, if you take it back to like a blue ocean strategy um, from a software perspective, you look at um, 
uh, Benioff and, and Salesforce and when he was disrupting uh, like the Oracles and the Cisco's and he was creating the concept of cloud. And then once he created the concept of cloud computing, then he uh, conveniently slotted a product into that, which was, you know, Salesforce.com. And that was that was a true blue ocean because at that point there wasn't really the concept of cloud. Everybody had like a server uh, sitting in their office somewhere as opposed to using any sort of hosted technology. So that was one way that I've seen. And actually, the, the that that story, that use case in the book behind me, Play Bigger. Um, and I, I, I love that story. But in a blue ocean like this, where this has been, ammonia has been an option, but it was never uh, a, a proper alternative because of the manufacturing process. Um, how do you how do you combine a sales and marketing strategy to take this to market to shift people's perspective of what they used to know about ammonia so that you can eventually because any sort of fuel any sort of fuel company has to at some point become become the become the de facto you have to become the de facto source that people always look to because that would be that like in in terms of your vision as a founder that's the way you're going to have the biggest positive impact on the world but that takes a lot of education it takes a lot of in my opinion it would take time so how do you actually bring this to market so that you do get that um that mass adoption of ammonia yeah so no it, it, it's a fundamental question so we start in agriculture. Uh, the reason yeah. is 80% of ammonia is, is utilized in agriculture globally. Farmers understand how to work with it. They know the economics. They know the they know the any of the challenges to to um, to utilization. So they're they are the immediate market, and, and they're huge. I mean, it's yeah. you know for us to keep up uh, for us to keep up with just the 5% compound annual growth rate within gray the gray ammonia industry we'd have to produce 100,000 systems a year like and and distribute those that's just to make that's just to make up for um for the growth in the existing market so that's huge um and it's a it's an extremely networked um industry in the sense that farmers really talk to each other, take care of each other uh, are, I mean, it's an incredible social network. So our expectation is that um, as these systems go out into their, into that market, um, it will spread like, um, you know, I'm not going to say wildfire because that's a horrible analogy. <laughs> that's not a great, great analogy, but I, <laughs> not a good analogy, but the idea being that it'll, it'll spread, it'll, and I'm not going to use viral either, you know, I'm so <laughs> limited what is our, what's happened to our language, but you understand what I'm saying that the, the word of mouth in terms of understanding the viability and importance of this is key. At the yeah. same time, we are working on, you know, very relevant partnerships as it relates to internal combustion. And that's both new engine manufacturing and conversion of existing um, uh, internal combustion engines. Uh, again, well understood, um, you know, not rocket science. Um, emissions can be absolutely controlled and, and, and to the point where, you know, the water vapor becomes your only emission if, if combustion is proper in the system. So the, that then becomes the, the, the part of the, sorry, the, the part of it that is, is truly um, revolutionary here again is the decentralized nature. So you yeah. could take, for an example, you could take a trucking, a long haul trucking, trucking company, right? So they've got fuel depots across the nation um, and their trucks run a regular schedule. There is no reason why those, those, a company like that wouldn't have a fuel positive system at every single depot. They'd have wind and solar generation. Um, they'd producing their own fossil fuel, uh, uh, carbon free fuel uh, yeah. in, in green ammonia and refueling their trucks. That's, a, that's one example. Um, again, the idea that this becomes such a widespread uh, decentralized um, solution that that provides for that independence. And I think this is something that we've learned. We've learned this through the pandemic in the sense that we are so vulnerable to supply chain uh, around yeah. the world, obviously. Um, but also, you know, pricing and supply is controlled by, you know, conglomerate type companies that you know, that aren't looking out for you and I, they're looking out for their, you know, for the interests of, of their shareholders in a, in a way that um, is not sustainable going into, you know, going into this, uh, the next number of years and, and the next uh, century ahead of us. We, we have got to figure out really intelligent ways of moving things down 
to a much more local level of of uh, uh, of supply and demand, and 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 this is what this a system like ours, this is what it entails, and and this is what it enables. And where do you see? And where, what is your vision for the company? Where do you see it going? Where do you see uh, the the size of the company? Do you, because it is a blue ocean, do you almost welcome competitors? Because if you see competitors in the space, that means you know that you're moving in the right direction, and more people are interested. Or what's what's your outlook for the next five years for for green ammonia? Well, for us, it's going to be the growth of manufacturing and distribution of our systems. So uh, we see them being deployed all over the world, quite frankly. We're okay. building them in 20 and 40 foot container platform for the the reason that they can be moved ar around the world where they're needed um, and then utilized on site um, for, for end user. Um, this is a, a potentially hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of, of revenue based on um, thousands and thousands of systems. So uh, it can become very big very, very quickly. Uh, and remember, the, the market that we're displacing is, a, an, is an antiquated, centralized yeah. market um, with end users who are desperate for change. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a perfect storm in the sense that adoption around that kind of change um, makes absolute sense. Um, so getting government support behind this, and I'm not really talking financially, but more on just in, in terms of, of um, stakeholder uh, in interest and importance in getting the message out that this is viable and, and this needs to happen, um, I think, it, again, is going to spread, it already is spreading rapidly, but I think once the awareness, once systems are out in the field, uh, once there's, you know, a real operational uh, data on this, it, it will grow dramatically. And, and we're scaling with that intent. We expect within the next couple of years, we'll be in a out of serial production into a mass production type uh, environment. And then I would say just a, a question for, for the uh, entrepreneur and me and the people that are listening. When you build out a company that is in such a, a novel, new industry, new technology, new IP, how do you how do you find people for your company? How do you find the right people to work with? Because this is this is this is mind blowing. Like this is again, it's not something where you can say, "Hey, I would love if you had X amount of years in in the green ammonia field." Like doesn't it doesn't it exist? Doesn't yeah, exactly. So how do you find the right people that can can make this happen? So it, again, that's a that's a wonderful and really important question, and 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 we build. Uh, we're building the team based on the core values of the company. So this is about um, this company is about change. Uh, it's about um, it's about honesty. It's about transparency. It's about all of the important values that that we've clearly stated um, on our website in every in every piece of communications that we create. Our values are front and center, and that attracts a very particular and specific type of person, right? So if, if we're selling, um, if we're selling the opportunity on a value base, um, not just on a technical base, you know, it's, it's, it, you really have to share the vision um, to participate in the company. So our hiring process is extremely focused on, on, um, on individual values and, and, um, and 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 really building the team dynamic in such a way that we're all you know pulling in the very very much the same direction, uh, and interestingly, there's a lot of engineers and scientists um, who are looking at this space now and have spent a lot of time recently in green hydrogen, um, which is a direct uh, uh, a direct component, of course, of, of green ammonia. Um, so there's a lot of people coming through the educational system who have an awareness and and an interest. So, I, I mean, you know, we're we're hiring actively right now, and and the the quality of of candidates that we're getting is extraordinary. Like really, amazing and people understanding, you know, that this is mission and value first, and and um, and delivery of of products second. And we've got again from a manufacturing depth and and skill sets. We've we've you know we're building the world class manufacturing team. Um, so. It's all coming together, and and uh, and as I said earlier, and you noted very very quickly. So and and that's you know that's a challenge in any company in our position is we're going to be in a very very rapid growth um, 
uh, process over the next, you know, 12, 18 months. That's going to be in super intense. So, you know, our HR um, discipline becomes extremely important to build the right team as, as, we, uh, as, we, as we move forward very, very, and grow very, very quickly. I just want to take a second and thank the sponsor of today's episode, NordVPN. Now, if you've ever missed out on your favorite shows because it's not available in your country, or if you're trying to keep your private time private, you don't want people spying on what you're doing, well, let me introduce you to NordVPN. If you're bored of US Netflix, why not take a spin in the UK? Use NordVPN, click of a button, you can do just that. You want to watch your favorite anime, you don't have to travel to Japan. NordVPN brings it right to you with 5,000 plus server options. No show is out of reach. And of course, we all love to binge TV and Netflix, but privacy is a big deal too. NordVPN keeps your information encrypted, so you never have to worry about your IP or location getting out. They've also doubled down on keeping you safe with their new threat protection feature. Say goodbye to intrusive web ads and malware. Even if you download an infected file, threat protection kicks in and deletes it before it makes a mess of your computer. Don't forget, if you're trying NordVPN, there is literally no risk to you. They have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Give it a try. If you like it, great. If you don't, they'll issue you a refund. You can pretend it never happened. They gave a special discount for Success Story podcast listeners. They gave a special offer. So go to my link at nordvpn.com slash success story to get your subscription started today. And say, let's say we fast forward 10 years, even 20 years. What if you could look back on, on this journey with uh, uh, like with Fuel Positive, what would be the impact that you want to have on the world? What's what's the thing that you want people to say about you? Well, I think that I I I I think Fuel Positive should be taking this this um, position in history where um, the shift away from fossil fuel dependency is is viable, meaning that we can take an existing industry. Um, and and not shut it down, not change, not make it go away in the sense that um, uh, that the automobile industry isn't going to go away, um, that internal combustion engines aren't going away, going away, but the way that they're fueled, the way that we operate, uh, changes dramatically. As well as throughout the agricultural sector, we expect that we'll have that impact globally as well. Um, Agriculture is a huge emitter um, of, of greenhouse gases um, on many uh, many different levels and, and, and many different aspects. Uh, but we believe again we can take some of the core emissions and eliminate those, quite frankly, and 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 create this this new and positive way of of um, of farming that that is sustainable. And, and we think we can be a, you know, an absolutely key aspect of that. So, I, I mean, those as, as two pretty fundamental legacy pieces, um, I think would, would, you know, that would be, that would be profound success for us, obviously. Amazing. Um, amazing. No, that's, that's great. Um, I wanted to, I want to pull out uh, a few like rapid fire uh, insights from you and your career. Um, but before we pivot, most importantly, uh, where can people connect with you? Um, do you want to send people to social to, if they have questions, do you want people to go check out a website? So any sort of links social that you want to, uh, to drop, go for it. So people well, can go think, find us. Yeah. 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 I mean, fuelpositive.com. We spend a lot of effort on our website and, and the depth and, and it's a very living site in the sense that it's, it's evolving constantly. Um, we've got a really, really active team. Um, uh, building that uh, building that community for us, um, so that's the right place to start. I mean, I'm easy to reach. I'm Ian at FuelPositive.com, so um, and very happy to take incoming inquiries. But on the website, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of questions are answered, and um, very very active FAQ section. Like, they, yeah, we're very very active. We're a public company as well, so of course, um, from from that perspective, we're transparent. So. Uh, you can learn a lot about us in in that context, uh, that context as well. And social media is building. I mean, the yeah. real thing for us is, you know, as soon as there's systems in the field again, as soon as there's something to take a picture of, uh, you know, it's it's being a, such a visual medium, 
Um, I again, we're going to focus very heavily on on building that story, building community around our end users as well. I think that's the, the stories. I mean, this is one of the things that's so great about the people, and now predominantly farmers who are coming in, who are who are really concerned about the environment. Um, who are incredibly innovative in terms of the types of change that they're willing and interested in implementing. I mean, these are fascinating people with and great stories and histories. I mean, I, you know, I would love uh, if, you know, it's one thing for me to talk about the company, but it's another thing for an yeah, end for user farmer, to talk farmer. about, yeah. you know, what is, you know, what's the real benefit here? What's the real experience? And, uh, and that, of course, that will, that will, um, that will replicate itself dramatically as, as systems are out, out in the real world. Yeah. Very smart. No, you're hundred percent correct. Like when you, when you start getting, um, it's always great to, to create something new, but when you start seeing how it actually impacts the lives of people, that's, that's when, that's when it all starts to, uh, like you start to realize what you're actually doing. So exactly. and that's, I, that's the yeah. joy, that's the joy, that's the excitement, that's the, you know, that's the record. I mean, you talked about recognition, that's kind of the recognition yeah. and legacy is, is really changing people's lives in a positive way and, and enabling that, you know, being part of being part of enabling that is, I think, a, you know, a real objective of, of fuel positive. Incredible. Okay, so let's let's go into some rapid fire, uh, just pulling out insights from from your life. So first question, uh, the biggest challenge that you've overcome in your personal or professional life? What was that? And how did you overcome it? Biggest challenge I it professionally has been um, get building the right team, right? So I've, I've gone through um, a whole bunch of different teams in the over the last couple of decades in terms of the different initiatives and companies that I've, I've built and been part of. And it's, it's so essential to get the right people. So I, I mean, I've suffered narcissists through various iterations. Uh, and <laughs> narcissism has become just sort of this, this, I, the attitude is that it's there's something normal about it, right, that it's it belongs in our it belongs in our in our psyche in some way. And I, I completely oppose that view. I think that there are so many people out there who are good, honest, team building, not driven by ego, um, mm -hmm. that make the best teams. And, and, and that's what I've got today in, in our company. It's like, and again, I, this came from learning the hard way, you know, working with people who, who, you know, only cared about their own interests and, and really didn't have the team at heart and, and didn't have the vision or, or values that were necessary. So that, 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 that is, that's been the big, biggest challenge and the biggest learning, I think, through my entire career. If you had to choose one person that has had a huge impact on your life, obviously there's been many, but pick one. Who was that person? What did they teach you? I think, um, you know, without getting too corny, I think my parents have, have provided a real um, beautiful basis for, again, humility um, and empathy. Um, you know, they they were able to listen. They really listened actively. I think that is, a. I mean, the skill and ability to do that, I think, is really important. And also as a business leader as well, I mean, you've got to hear people. You've got to be able to hear people, not just tell people, you know, and you and too many, too many people, too many entrepreneurs think they have all the answers. They're not looking for any support. They just want to get their things done, right? And they're not, uh, they're not listening well. So they've had a huge impact. Um, of course, as a young person, you know, working uh, alongside and and in the vicinity, or even in the aura of of Ansel Adams, you know, mm -hmm. created a, a a real attitude. He was such a humble, again, a very humble. Um, very funny, but very serious person. And, uh, and, and that had a big impact on me, obviously, as a, as a young person. And, and I hope I carried that sensibility through <laughs> to, to where I am today. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's good. That's good. That's a, that's a smart, a smart lesson too. Um, just the fact to be open to, to learning and to be humble and to, to know oh, that yeah. you don't know everything. Oh, I think God. even that, that alone is something that can, um, take a lot of people to to the next level in their career in their business whatever um Absolutely. yeah no very very smart uh if you could pick a, a book or podcast or or something that people should go check out that you've enjoyed that has impacted your life in some way business or non-business what would that be um well 
as a Canadian, um, I, you know, really focus on the an entire Canadian Broadcasting Corporation mm -hmm. network of, of information. I think there's something about Canadian broadcasting and it could be, I, I mean, you know, just from the news through to special interests and so on. Um, so many interesting things. I, I think David's the work that David Suzuki has done over the years and, and his foundation today is, uh, is a really, really important um, organization that, that provides, you know, such broad analysis of, of issues globally. And, and I've, you know, had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times through my career. He's just, again, a straight talker, you know, direct to the point, uh, doesn't get caught up in the, in, in, you know, all of the, the politics of things, but, but pushes through to the, um, to the key issues. I think that's, that's incredibly important. Um, another thing that we're doing, we're, you know, becoming involved in, in um, the Aboriginal Business Association across Canada. Um, there's a, a real important application for our technology in remote communities. So to provide, um, to provide energy and fertilizer and, and fuel and so on. Um, in communities that are now relying completely on diesel um, to support themselves. So I, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from, um, from the indigenous peoples across the world, in fact, you know, who have, have lived and breathed um, these, you know, these incredible places that we now call home for, for you know, for centuries and, and millennia. For so, much longer than we've been here. So exactly, yeah. We're, yeah it, it, drop in the bucket uh, in terms of time you know, exactly yeah. um if you could tell your 20 year old self one thing what would that be um <laughs> it's a really good question i i would i i would probably say you know um probably slow down a little bit you know uh, appreciate things a little bit more i i as a 20 year old i couldn't move fast enough you know through things uh and this it had a good good element in that I was trying to always sort of be ahead of the head of things, uh, which is great. But I I, I don't think I s kind of slowed down enough to uh, to appreciate things. Um, I was lucky as a young person to travel a lot. I would I would say to any twenty year old, you know, get out and if you can, if you have any means, you know, get out to see your country. But but if you can travel anywhere in the world, and you know, COVID notwithstanding, you know see this planet because it gives you such a different appreciation for what it is that we're all working for here, especially, you know, from an environmental perspective. Um, the more, I mean, the great thing today that didn't exist then, of course, is, is, is social media and the ability and, you know, Google Earth, you can literally explore the world, but, um, you know, to get out there to learn about new cultures and different cultures and, and be accepting, not tolerant, I hate the word tolerant, be, to be an accepting person. Um, and I've tried to live my life that way as well. And then last question, what does success mean to you? Happiness, uh, peace, calm. Um, yeah, it, it balance, you know, the, the, just that whole sense that, that everything, um, everything feels right. Uh, you know, that, that to me is, that's, that's success. Um, and that involves everything from, you know, every aspect of our lives. If, if you can, if you feel happiness, um, you're, you're so far ahead of most people in the world. And, um, it, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a real, it's, that's my ultimate goal is to feel happy with my life and to feel that I've really uh, contributed in some meaningful way.